Okay, I think we'll begin um, and hopefully other people will join us um, as we start. My name is Paula Harrison um, and I'm the coordinator at University Centre Telford. So a warm welcome to everybody um, for tonight's lecture with Dr Louise Fenton. Um, uh, as I say, a very warm welcome to everybody who's joined us and thank you very much to Louise uh, for presenting tonight. Um, before I hand over to Louise, just a little bit of background on University Centre Telford. We are part of the University of Wolverhampton and for those of you who don't know the area, we're based in Telford in the heart of the town, um, which is a small town in Shropshire. We would normally hold our public lecture programme in the centre and Louise has been and presented this very lecture um, in March of this year, just before the lockdown, um, and it was very successful. Um, but obviously because of the current pandemic, we've had to move our lecture programme online. Um, so we've run a series of lectures and Louise's lecture is the first of um, some arts um, and culture lectures. Um, just so that I can tell you a little bit about um, the format tonight, Louise is going to speak first for about 40 minutes and then we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Uh, the, you are muted so you will have to write your Q&A, um, your questions in the Q&A section. If you're on a desktop um, that's at the bottom of the screen um, and if you write your question there, I will see it and I will read it out for Louise. Um, if you're on a mobile device, it will appear in the top right hand corner of your device. Um, so hopefully we'll have time for lots of questions. But Louise has already very kindly said that if we run out of time, then she's going to give you her email address and you can email her with any questions that you've got. So without further ado, I'd like to warmly welcome Louise tonight and introduce her. Um, she is a cultural historian, illustrator and writer. She has a BA and an MA in illustration from the University of Wolverhampton and she completed a PhD on the representations of voodoo at the University of Warwick in 2010. Louise is now a senior lecturer in contextual studies at the University and her recent research has been focused on the visual and literary representations of otherness and the social history of witchcraft, voodoo and zombies. So very welcome to Louise and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you Paula. Um, well hello and welcome to this evening lecture. It's very strange giving talks online but uh, I do appreciate you all taking time out to listen tonight. Um, so as Paula said, I'm Louise Fenton. I'm from the University of Wolverhampton. And I'd like to thank, before I start, thank Paula and Shirley for all the work they put in behind the scenes to get these talks up and running. They've been invaluable. So the talk tonight is going to be about the Age of Fire, which is witchcraft in 17th century Iceland. I'll start with a brief overview of um, the history of Iceland and how witchcraft came to come to a small island in the north of Europe. I will then go on to talk about the accused, the accusers, the executions, before moving finally on to documents that are still available today and the museum and I will talk a little bit about a couple of spells. I don't practice them but um, they may be of interest. Okay, so I'm now going to start by sharing the screen. So hopefully everything will work perfectly. There we go. So I don't know if Paula, you can come online and just give me a thumbs up to say that's on. That's fine. Yes, okay. I can see right then. So as you can see, the, um, the title is The Age of Fire. I think we might have some firefighters listening and if they are, you may be a little bit disappointed with what this is about. Not, might not be quite what you thought. Um, if any of you do want to email me, my email address is on the screen now and it's louise.fenton at wlv.ac.uk. So I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions if you do want to email and we run out of time for any reason. So 
We're very fortunate in Iceland that their history is well documented. This is called the Landnamabok and it details the history from the 9th century. And the tradition in Iceland is that generation after generation would copy the history and add to it. So we've actually got an account of history from 834 and it goes all the way through. And in the museum, you can see a book from every century. Um, and it's really very unique that that has happened. What's also really unusual is that the language, the Icelandic language has changed very little from the ninth century through to today. And this makes reading documents and reading accounts very easy for people who speak Icelandic, obviously, um, because there isn't that difference over time. If you think about a lot of old English documents were either written in Latin or the language changed quite dramatically, that didn't happen in Iceland. So it gives us access to these wonderful documents. The name of Iceland is under some contention where it generated from. Um, it was known as Snowland for quite some time before a Norwegian arrived. Um, his name was, and I'll, a quick apology now, if any of you speak Icelandic and I'm getting the pronunciations wrong, I apologise, I'm still learning. His name was Hafner Flocki Vilgarsson and he named, he alleged to have stood on a mountain, looked at the landscape and said this is just Iceland. So from that point it was called Iceland. However, there are also documents that say that Irish monks were there before the Vikings even entered onto Iceland. And these Irish monks were scholars and they just called it island as in I-S-L-A-N-D and other languages translated this as I just island and but the name Iceland stuck so um, still some debate on that. The parliament in Iceland was formed in 934 AD it's the oldest operating parliament in the world and it was called the Alpingi and at the Alpingi the Althing was a general meeting of all the important leaders from around the country. They met, they were powerful leaders and they were there to decide on laws and distribute justice. So they, were, they all came together in this site and you can still go to the site, the flag's flying as you can see, but it's obviously now moved to a building in Reykjavik. However, it's been non-interrupted since 934. In the year 1000, Christianity was announced at the Alpingi by the Althing to be the official religion of Iceland. So Christianity was officially stamped in 1000. There would have been shamanic witchcraft, which was called Say, which occurred and was documented in that book I mentioned, um, from about the ninth century. So from 834, there are documents of sorcery and spells. It was known as side by the Vikings. Cider was the practice of magic and magical rituals. And what's interesting at this time is that female practitioners were known as the Visen Dakona or women of science. The men were known as the side men or the men of magic as in magic men. So it was deemed that women couldn't possibly do magic. Whereas in Europe, witchcraft and witches were always or predominantly women. In Iceland, women couldn't do it. Only men understood magic and sorcery. So why did witchcraft end up in Iceland? Well, if you look at this map, this is a very early map of Europe in the 17th century, showing where the witch craze had been, had been affected really. So any, as the color gets warmer, that's the more intensity from the witch trials and the witch craze. So as you can see, Germany, here in the middle we've got Scotland and Iceland is actually quite warm in colour so it was already a hotbed of witchcraft. So how did it end up? In the late 10th century as I said in the year 1000 it was decided that Iceland should reject its old ways. It had mythology, Norse ways of practice, it was classed as pagan and they should adopt a new faith, Christianity. The island itself, battles were ensuing from the 12th century, Norway, Denmark, Sweden were all trying to gain a foothold there. However, Denmark inherited it in the 16th century. 
So from the 1500s, Denmark was, was in charge. So Iceland adopted Danish laws, Danish practices. If you look at the image on the left, this is the Malleus Maleficarum, a notorious book published in Latin. It translates as the Hammer of Witches. This book was the definitive guide in the 15th century of how to deal with witchcraft. It explains how you could torture witches, how you could spot them, what to look out for, and ultimately how to get rid of them. It was widespread across Europe, so the Danish would have read this book. However, it didn't really permeate into Iceland, and I'll talk about that in a little while. What did happen though, if you look at the center image, Denmark was in charge of Iceland from the 1500s and King James of England went out to Denmark to marry Anne of Denmark, that was to be his queen. And on their journey home, they went to Iceland and from leaving Iceland to Scotland initially, their boats were struck by massive storms. And King James started to think that this was witchcraft, it was sorcery, it was evil practices. And when he got back to Scotland, he decided um, that he knew what was going on. This was witchcraft at its worst. And this image is a woodcut. The black figure in the pulpit is a local school teacher who was accused of running a coven of female witches that you can see in the top right with their cauldron. They're flying on broomsticks, they're practicing evil deeds, and although it's hard to see, the ship that's at the top left is surrounded by demons. And as a result of this, later, King James decided he needed to write something. The Malleus Maleficarum was nearly 100 years old. So he wrote Demonology, which again is in three books, one of which is to eradicate witches, what to look for, what to do. And sorry, my screen's not working, bear with me. There we go. I just wanted to put this in because this is a very common symbol um, and is an example of a sigil and a lot of spells were for visual, they were very visual, so you see a lot of symbology in the witchcraft of Iceland, which is the same across Europe, you do see signs and symbols, but even more so, and a lot of these were based on Norse mythology, so I just wanted to mention that one. So, the Age of Fire. Sorcery was commonly practiced in Iceland until the 17th century when the Age of Fire basically finished it off. It was known as Brennvold, which was known as the Age of Fire. And during this period, 200 people were accused of either practicing witchcraft or having possession of dangerous, in inverted commas, witchcraft or magical artifacts. The population of Iceland at this time was quite small, so this was a large percentage of the population. Because Christianity had been deemed the official religion, when I show you a map in a moment, you'll understand that the northern area, which is known as the West Fjord, was very late to convert to Christianity. It's an incredible, incredibly rural area that was difficult to access, and they still practice their pagan Norse magic. The very first execution was in 1652, and the big difference with the rest of Europe was that the executed was a man. Men were held responsible for the casting or inscribing of runes, of magical practice, and during these 200 accusations, 20 men were executed and only one woman. So you can see the disparity between Europe and Iceland was in totally different, totally different. In Europe, the accused tended to be the old women or women, it's less, it's arguable now whether it was always old women, but it tended to be women who lived alone or maybe lived together and they lived on the fringes of society. They may have helped with um, things like childbirth or medicine, but there was, all, there was always an air of suspicion of women living on their own. However, in Iceland, this couldn't really happen because a lot of these communities were so isolated and incredibly remote. If you think 
the, where I'm going to show you, the West Fjords are very detached from the mainland. They are sparsely populated. They are rugged landscapes. They reared sheep and fished, and those were the two main areas of their support. So in winter time, when the harsh winters hit, and they were harsh with severe snow, the communities tended to live in dwellings together. They would pull their resources, all live together, and occasionally it would be the men that went out to fish or to hunt. So they weren't there all the time, and therefore it was the men that were at risk, not the women. There was a law against witchcraft proclaimed in 1630, so it did become illegal in 1630, and that comes from the Danish legal system. However, what was interesting and is documented that the aristocracy of Iceland and the aristocracy of Denmark that lived in Iceland decided to ignore this. They felt that their sorcery and their magical practice and their belief in runes was totally different to what the peasants did. They classed them as heathens and they were people who practiced really old fashioned ways of magic and it was witchcraft, whereas what they did was acceptable. Although the Malleus Maleficarum had reached Iceland, European methods to accuse or identify, to identify witches weren't used. Whereas in Europe, we know about the pinpricking, we know about the ducking stool, you know, if you, if you float, you're guilty, if you sink, you were innocent and it's too late anyway. Um, we know about the stripping to see marks, the accusations of having familiars, like a cat or another animal. This didn't happen. All that they needed was magical symbols or magical objects. So the predominant theme was that if somebody fell ill or had an accident, they would then blame somebody that they didn't particularly like. And the one they accused would then have to prove their innocence. Should magical artifacts be found, they were automatically guilty and likely to be executed. And the magical objects are, and this is really unbelievable when you read it today, an odd shaped pebble, a runic book booklet, which okay, that is a bit more magical, suspicious inscribed wood or suspiciously inscribed anything, or a raven feather. If any of those were found in the possession of the accused, it was automatic guilt. There was nothing they could do. Quite brutal. So this is a map of Iceland. The pink line on the side is the route I actually took from Reykjavik to Holmavik. And as you can see, the top left-hand corner, I don't know if it comes up or not, my, my little arrow, but the top left-hand corner is the West Fjords. And as you can see, it's joined by a very thin spit of land and would have been quite detached from the rest of Iceland during the 17th. It still is. It's only one road in and out, but it would have been even more difficult to access during the 17th century. And it was there, that area that was much slower in adopting Christianity and continued with the practice of witchcraft. Just as a side, if anyone does want to get inspired and when all the lockdown's over and we can travel again and go to Iceland, please do, because I was warned off driving up to the West Fjords. I was told it was impassable. I'd end up falling off a bridge, that the roads were atrocious. From Reykjavik to Holmavik, they're beautifully tarmacked roads. I drove for three hours and saw two cars. It was magical, beautiful scenery. So please don't be put off by rumors of um, potholes the size of, just pins or anything. So that's the route up to Holmovic. This is a, the welcome sign and I showed you the sigil of the Helm of Or a few moments ago because as you can see the bottom left hand corner they've adopted that now as the county symbol and it's on t-shirts and tattoos and embellishing mugs and all sorts of tourist paraphernalia but it's now widely used even though it is a magical symbol and would have been banned and you would have been executed for having it a few hundred years ago. This is Holmovic today. Um, this is on the West Fjord on the right hand side. It's a very small town. Um, it consists of a shrimp factory, a few fishing boats, one restaurant, which I think they must be fed up with fish because the restaurant is pasta and pizza. Um, one supermarket, one 
guest house, one hotel, one post office, one church and one museum and that's it. It's really small, it's remote, but it is stunning. It's absolutely stunning. This is another view of Holmavik from, this is where the hotel is and you can see the church on the side, but this is looking down into the town. There are still a few buildings from the 18th century, but not very many because they're, they're quite weak construction. So this map shows where the accusations occurred of witchcraft around Iceland. You can see little red dots. For those of you who have got incredibly good eyesight, there are some little fires. I will show a close up in a minute. The little fires show where the execution sites for burning were. It was the most severe punishment. And so witchcraft was deemed to be the most severe crime. Other executions happen for other crimes, but I mean, they say it was the worst. I've read accounts of beheadings, which took several attempts, so I'm not convinced, but it was deemed to be the most severe punishment. But as you can see from this, Reykjavik is down on the left side where you can see a fire just inland. So there's a little spattering there, but most of the accusations and the executions did take place in the West Fjords. And that's up on the little bit that's on the edge of Iceland. This is a little close up. So when I first started my research, most things you read state that Holmavik was the home of witchcraft. That is where the executions took place. That's where all the accusations happened. So I naively headed there thinking that that was where it was all happening and it wasn't. Um, there were only actually four cases in Holmavik itself. However, I originally went out, I should have given you a bit of context, I originally went out to Iceland to look at the museum, that was the reason, but I got totally hooked on, interested and fascinated by the accounts of witchcraft and the fact it was men, not women. As you can see from there, in the middle, there's a little cluster of red and there's a little fire. And I'm just gonna talk briefly about this particular area. This is called Kista and it's Trekilisvik in the Strandir region. Strandir is the county area where Holmavik is and um, Trekilisvik. This bit of land that you can see is where executions took place. And I'm just gonna give you a brief account of this because the reasoning behind some of them are quite extraordinary. In 1652, reports started circulating around an illness that was happening here it's a very, very remote area in North Strandier. In the documents, the afflicted, it was described as an evil spirit or a demon was causing turmoil or disruption in the church. And every time a sermon happened, it would cause women to belch very loudly. Now, the Icelandic have a real thing about wind. They really do concern, there are spells, farting runes, farting spells and belching spells, which are deemed to be some of the worst that you could possibly inflict on anybody. So it was understood that these sermons would cause women to belch and they had swollen stomachs and it appeared that virgins were the worst afflicted. They were more prone. And in one instance, 12 women had to be carried out of church, foaming at the mouth and having this affliction. Anyway, two years later, a new sheriff arrives in town. His name was uh, Mr. Courtson, and he took off. He um, took office and married one of into one of the most powerful families in the West Fjords. He decided to investigate, and he took advice from Parliament. So he went out to the the Althingi to get advice from um, the people who really know about this kind of thing and ask advice. And they said, "Well, is there anybody you suspect?" And he said, "Yes, I do. There is one man." one man in particular that I think is guilty of this and his name is Porter Gubinson. So they arrested him and they questioned him and he did, he did state that he admitted he'd seen the devil in the shape of a fox. Now foxes were prolific in Iceland. The arctic fox was responsible for killing so many of the flocks of sheep that people were constantly in battle trying to keep foxes away. Now the foxes were seen to be evil and demonic and so he just said that he'd seen this fox and he'd sent it to this village and therefore the fox was causing the problem. He also mentioned another man that 
um, he said he had advice from. His name was Egil. And Eagle said that he had also been able to kill a sheep with his sorcery and that he could will the devil to do whatever he wanted him to do. Why you would say that in a time of witchcraft and executions is beyond me, but he did. So very quickly after both were burnt on the stake on the 20th of September, 1654. But during the trial, they also just mentioned the name of a third man who happened to be somebody they weren't very happy with. He'd taken some land off one of them or there was an argument over livestock and he was executed too. So it was very brutal. There seemed to be very little that you could do once accused, but this is the process. So somebody was accused by someone in the community and usually the accusation was down to somebody having an illness or a bit of misfortune, but it was generally directed at somebody that they didn't like. Now, once that had happened, you could think you were doomed and pretty much you'd, you wouldn't want to be in this situation. So they had to have someone in authority swear their innocence, stand up in front of the judicial system and say, no, this person is absolutely innocent. There is no way they've done this. There was a jury system so that in these really remote areas, a man of God would oversee the trial and he would be supported by 12 people that he had selected. Very rarely a woman was involved, but it would be 12 people of their choice. So the next option they had was to convince the jury of their innocence individually. So they had to go to each and every one of the jury and claim their innocence and convince each and every one of them that they were innocent, then they would be acquitted. The other point was to prove beyond any doubt that they were not a sorcerer. Well, if they'd found any of those objects I mentioned, a strange shaped pebble or a raven feather, that was it, instant guilt. So if, if on the rare occasion they were found innocent, the case was dismissed. And the man of God who oversaw this, and I say man of God because there were bishops, vicars and priests, they had the right to take their material belongings if they were found guilty. So if they were guilty, the case would be concluded. A man of God would take their possessions and he would order the burning. And that happened immediately. As soon as he convicted them, said they were guilty, burnt at the stake, the fire would be put set outside. It was sometimes made from the possessions of the guilty. Sometimes it was driftwood. Occasionally they would burn two people together and that was because they needed to save the resources for the harsh winters. But it was that brutal. You have got time before your trial to try and get your innocence. But once you were in the trial, it was make or break, guilty or innocent. So some of the, the crimes that came about. Jan Rognvaldsen was burned in 1652. He was accused of raising a ghost. He was accused of it. He never said he did it. Somebody accused him of raising the ghost. And they said they found papers with runic characters on. He denied all accusations, but was still burnt. Sigurda Jonsson burnt in 1671. Now he admitted he'd fought a ghost off and he frightened it with herbs on his own semen. He was convicted. Ari Paulson burnt in 1681. He had no one to swear his innocence and his only crime was being overheard saying that he knew how to find out if a woman was a virgin. That was it, that was his crime. And that was what led to his death. So it was very brutal. And we look at this now in disbelief that somebody can be executed for being overheard to say, oh, I know, I know whether a woman's a virgin or not, but that was how, how it was. Reverend Paul Bjornsson is quite an interesting case. Um, he was a pastor. Um, he was considered one of the most learned men in Iceland of his time. He could, he wrote famous sermons. He could write in Greek and Latin. He communicated with Europe scholars. He wrote books on navigation. Later, after all this in 1674, he wrote a treatise on magic. 
and he, he it was called the character bestiae most of it was heavily on the malleus maleficarum but he felt icelandic people needed to know about witchcraft although much of what they accused icelanders of was different to european witchcraft he still wrote this book now what was interesting is in 1669 paul's wife helga had an illness she had a strange sickness that caused her to be bedridden for more than six months and while she was bedridden, she claims that a ghost was wreaking havoc in her home. She then decided the only person that could have caused this was Jan Leifsson, a young man who she had denied the right to marry one of her maids. So she just decided it must be him. Without much ado, he was accused and burnt. So they thought that would be it, that would be over. However, soon afterwards, about five years, I say soon afterwards, about five years later, she became ill again and so did her two sons. So we've now got her and her two sons were quite poorly. And as a result, she accused two men of causing it with very little option, the legal system, and Reverend Paul Bjornsson, because it was his decision, burnt them. So that's three now. Shortly after that, a couple of years later, Helga suffered again. And this time she accused two people. And this was the only female that was ever burnt in Iceland. And her name was Puridur Olafsdottir. She was born, burnt in 1678, again, causing illness. And her son was also burnt at the same time. And that was Jan Helgeson. So the two of them were burnt. So now we've got five people have been executed on the say-so of Helga and they were accused by Reverend Bjornsson. In 1683, still another man, Svein Arneson, was accused of causing illness to the daughter of Reverend Paul Bjornsson. Um, she was claimed as being sick and Reverend Paul decided that no, he's guilty, she's ill because of him. However, in contemporary documents, it does state that Reverend Paul Bjornsson's daughter did quite like a drink. Um, she was suffered from anxiety a lot, she was quite nervous, but it's well documented that she was drinking quite a lot. So how much that had to do with her illness, we can only speculate. So a lot of people were executed under the say-so of Reverend Bjornsson. Another really famous trial is the Kirkubol trial, and this was led by Pastor John Magnusson. And the reason this is so well known is that the pastor wrote down all of his account, his side of the story. So it began with Pastor John Magnusson became ill, and he accused John Johnson Sr. and John Johnson Jr. So father and son were accused of making him ill. During their trial period, they confessed that they did know about magical signs. They did know about magic. And Jan Jonsson also said that he did put a farting spell on a girlfriend. And as I said, the farting spell was deemed to be quite serious because it was humiliating, it was embarrassing, and it was degrading. And that was the worst thing you could wish on somebody, apparently. They were both found guilty and both were burned together. And as a result, Pastor Magnuson was awarded all of their material holdings. However, this compensation wasn't enough for this particular pastor. And he started proceedings against the daughter. However, the authorities had had enough. They said that he was getting hysteric. They couldn't understand the allegations. And so they said that the daughter needed to swear her innocence and she would be released, which she did. So the case was dismissed. But what was in the law at that time is that if this happened, if a pastor accused somebody and they were found innocent, they were then entitled to have the pastor's holdings. So although her father and her brother had been executed and all of their material holdings taken away, she was then awarded them back under the the law when she was found innocent. So there was a little divine retribution. But Reverend John did write a book with his side of the process, which is why this is so well known. 
scholars today have studied his um, illness in inverted commas, which today they feel could be explained by possibly malnutrition, possibly influenza, or consumption of corn infected by an hallucinogenic fungi, which is also what is now believed to be what caused the hysteria in Salem and the Salem witch trials as well. So one of those is likely to be the cause. I just wanted to put up the list. These are the names and the dates of everybody who was executed. So Svein Arneson was the final one in 1683, but all of these people were burnt on a fire unnecessarily for the most minor of accusations. The other thing which makes these particularly horrific is that sometimes during the execution, the fire burnt the ropes before the people had actually died and they leapt from the flames. And many of them leapt from the flames saying, look, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I've been burnt free, only to find they were then pushed back onto the fire to die. So very grim. Um, but as I said, 20 men and one woman, one woman, so very different to elsewhere. And so how did it come to an end? Well, these were turbulent religious times, so accusations of witchcraft were across the 17th century. But in the 18th century, there was a violent eruption of a, a volcano on Iceland called the Lucky Volcano, and it killed over 9,000 people. This was then followed by a famine, which due to the death of livestock, another quarter of the population that were left died. And with all these other things going on, accusations of witchcraft then declined. There was very few accusations after this time. Iceland got its independence in the 1940s from Denmark, but it does retain close ties with both Denmark and America. And what's interesting these days, there is an, a revival of Icelandic nationalism reviving the importance of the sagas, which are the tales of the Nordic myths and where the origins of many of the beliefs came from. And this is still happening today. So there are new, new I guess it's similar to um, Wicca in witchcraft in the UK. There are religions that have come up over the last 30 years or so, or Icelandic nationalism, which is really holding on to their cultural identity. There are documents that survive, so I'm going to talk just a little bit for a few minutes just about what, what's still available. There are documents that survive from throughout the witch trials. The representatives of God, the bishops, the pastors, the vicars, they kept meticulous records of the trials as well as their own diaries. So you've got actual court and trial documents and the personal diaries. There are also some of the Galdra box or magic books. Now these were hidden. So many families had a Galdra box, which would feature all those little sigils, magical drawings, spells, details of how to create the spells. And in Iceland, we are so fortunate because seven survived. When they were found, most of them were burnt because they were deemed to be too powerful and needed to be destroyed. But they were hidden, many were hidden in dwellings. And this tradition of copying and continuing to copy means that many of them now survive and we've got them today. They were copied so we have access to spells and images from the last 300 years. So there are historical documents. Um, this is one of the pages. They're beautifully written. They're beautiful artifacts in their own right. This was one written by one of the bishops. Very rarely did the bishops actually draw out the symbols or sigils that they found. And that's believed because they, they were believed to have such magical powers and to be so powerful, there was a fear of if you duplicate or draw them, you too could be accused of witchcraft or they would have a power over you too. However, this particular document does store some of them and these are images of the sigils that were found in the accused's dwelling. These are just some pages from the accusation and the witch trial. So on the left, it starts in Latin and it gives the date, 1678, and it then talks about the trial, what the accusers, what the accusations were, right the way through to the right page where it states that they're to be burned. And at the end of the trial, all 12 of the jurors had to sign their name and then the overriding decision was by the priest, the bishop, the vicar to say that they were going outside to be burned.
so the magic books this is one of the oldest in existence this is the Galdra book and as you can see it's very fragile it's very um it's a beautiful beautiful artifact in its own right it's wrapped in leather um, on vellum pages it has been reproduced and you can if any of you are really interested this is the only one that's been totally reproduced as a facsimile you can now buy this from the museum of witchcraft in iceland they now do mail order they do post out and it's the only one that's got an english translation of the spells and the text so you have this lovely little box with two books in one is a complete facsimile of the galdra book the other is um, a translation of the text and the, and the spells beautiful object to have it's only small but um, delicious if you're interested in visual imagery or in the witchcraft side of it. These are just two of the pages and as you can see the helm of ore on the right hasn't changed very much. These are different symbols for different spells and they they do adapt over time but they're still very much of what they were. This is an example from the late 19th early 20th century just showing that these books are continuing to be copied and reproduced and this is a family copy. This is in the Museum of Iceland at the moment so it can be seen but you can see that the sigils are there, the text is there, explanations of the, the spells and you will see these going back over time but as I said we're very fortunate that seven of these did survive. So accessing history, these are the archives in um, Iceland in Reykjavik. I have to say they're the very best archivists I've ever come across. They are so helpful. They mark out every page where there was witchcraft trials. They translated for me as my, although I could spot the odd word, my Icelandic is non-existent. Um, they marked out where the images were. But you can as I said, if, if you've got somebody who can speak Icelandic, which I met somebody there who did, they could translate it for me, even though these documents are hundreds of years old because the language hasn't changed. This is the library which belongs to the University of Reykjavik, Iceland, and they hold the Galdra box, all but one. That little one is held at the archive, the other six are held here, but most of the time they're on display somewhere in a museum in Iceland, so it's worth finding out if you do want to see them. This was the reason that all this began, the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in Iceland. It's in Holmavik. It's got a little cafe and two rooms, two big rooms. Downstairs is all about um, spells and has artifacts, either replicas or real. Upstairs is more about the history with some of the documents, but well worth a visit. Famously, the Necropants. If you've never heard of them, these are they. This is a replica, I have to say. It's a spell for money. You were supposed to have the permission of somebody who was dying to take their skin from their lower body. So you would carefully detach the skin, peel it off, keeping it intact with no holes, otherwise it wouldn't work, other than nature's own holes. You would then put some coins in the scrotum and wear them as tights. You would then keep them on and they would bring you wealth. When it came to the end of your days, to be able to pass them on, you obtained permission from whoever wanted them. You would then take one leg down. They would then have to put their leg in and it had to be a transition where at no point were the necro pants empty and they would then benefit from wealth as well. The spell at the bottom right hand corner is for controlling the wind. So you would take the head off this ling fish. You would then use blood to carve into the, the wood, it's very specific. Direct it at the ocean and however high the head is pointing is how strong the wind would be and you, you can control the wind, allegedly. Obviously you have the living dead, there's always a zombie in a museum that's related to witchcraft. I've never gone anywhere where there isn't, so here's your, your customary living dead person crawling from the ground. But a lot of the things are really fascinating Icelandic spells. For example, this one in the bottom right hand corner. This is um, the sea mouse spell. And I'm, I'm going to have to look at this because I'd hate to get it wrong. So you catch a carnivorous sea mouse, which is the little um, strange object on the right. You carve the ring helm on the skin of a black tomcat with 
the blood of a virgin or it has to be the menstrual blood of a virgin you catch a sea mouse in a net made from a virgin's hair you then keep it in a wooden box and the ring helm must be over the mouse to prevent it escaping a stolen coin is then placed in the box and this leads to the sea mouse drawing money from the ocean if the sea mouse escapes it causes a dangerous and devastating storm and causes the loss of many lives. And the reason this spell was so important is because it was so difficult to own any land or gain any wealth in Iceland because powerful families controlled so much. So this was one way of doing it. Whether it worked or not, I don't know. There are resources if any of you want to read further into this. Um, C. Smith wrote Icelandic Magic in 2015 and Dr. Stephen Flowers, Icelandic Magic in 2016. They're interesting if you're interested in spells and the grimoires. However, there's very little historical context, which is what I hope to fill the gap with when all this comes to fruition. If you like art, art is also becoming a way of um, researching this subject. This is from uh, Jesse Bransford, who's an artist in New York. He merged Icelandic landscapes with the sigils and signs. And this was published by Fulgore Press in the UK, and it's called A Book of Staves. Oh, there's some novels. Um, the Glass Woman by Caroline Lee is a beautiful novel set in historic Iceland during the fear of witch trials about an arranged marriage. Or if you want something more contemporary, a contemporary crime drama um, is Last Rituals. It's the debut novel by Ursa Sigurd Um It's set in now but she goes to all the places around the Icelandic fjords, goes to the witch museum and historic sites. So beautifully written. And that's more or less it. So I hope that's given you an introduction to the wonderful world of Icelandic witchcraft and the weird and wonderful ways in which they persecuted their condemned. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now. I will take the screen down and Paul is joining me to ask any questions. So please type your questions in. If you think of something later, do email me louise.fenton at wlv.ac.uk. Um, but thank you for your listening. And it's very strange talking to a silent audience, can I say? <laughs> Thanks very much, Louise. That was absolutely fascinating. Brilliant. And I've got five questions for you already. So, um, we will start with those. Um, so the first one is from Kat um, and she says that she was lucky enough to visit Holmavik with friends in the area. She was curious through talking to them and reading that there are a lot of stories of bishops and religious men being accused of witchcraft in many villages. Do you think that this was in rebellion to the enforced Christianity or change of lifestyle of the people of these villages um, and the population? And she says... Absolutely. Yeah, without a doubt. As I said, some of them were very fearful of even drawing the sigils and the signs in their diaries because of the fear of being accused. And if you think that Christianity was deemed to be the religion from the year 1000, this is 600 years later when these practices shouldn't even be occurring. And I think um, there were as I said, it was so difficult to prove your innocence. Somebody just had to accuse you and it was so difficult to then say, get out of it. Although 180 people did, it was very, it must have been a time of such fear. But yes, very much, I do think it was rebellion to the Christianity, definitely. Are you still there, Paula? Yes, I am. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Had some technical difficulties there. I'm not sure what happened. So sorry, I've actually lost some of the questions now. Oh, I've got some in front of me. They're under answered, I think. There's some under answered and some under open. Okay. I haven't got any now. I see. Okay, I'll start. I'll work through the ones I've got. Sorry, um, there's an anonymous uh, asking: Have many Icelandic historians written on this subject, and can I recommend any publications? 
um, as I said, the, there's very little written about this, which is quite good for me as an academic to come into this field. The, there is a little bit in those two books I mentioned. Dr. Stephen Flower's book on Icelandic magic is really interesting. Icelandic historians haven't written a lot about this period of time. Um, there, has been, there have been books written, but they haven't been translated. So unless you read Icelandic, you're a bit stuck. I'm working with colleagues at Reykjavik. We've got links now with Reykjavik University. So whether something will come from that, I don't know. But um, I would recommend Stephen Flowers' book. I would recommend C. Smith's book, but also the two novels that I've mentioned because they write about this period really, they're beautiful. The next question was um, from Jane, are the Goldra box accessible? As I said, you can buy that one, which is a complete facsimile, which is wonderful. So you can access that. They are usually in museums on display, at least two of them, the one from the 18th, 19th century and the really old one. If they're not on display, they will be at the archive and the library and you can make appointments to access them. So that's absolutely fine. Um, okay, I've got one. Yes, you can contact me on my Twitter account, somebody's asked, that's fine. Okay. Right, so can I say a little bit more about why they only believe men were capable of magic? I think it's, it's really fascinating, but the whole magic and sorcery was very male centered. And that goes back to 834. So we're not talking a few years, sorcery. And I, it's got a lot to do with the Norse mythology. Odin was really powerful. Um, but they, they felt that women hadn't got the possible power. They could be logical. Women were very logical and ran the homestead. So when the men were out hunting and fishing, it was down to the women to cook, to clean, to maintain the houses. But they felt that women were scientific. They had a logical brain, whereas men could be more open and more magical. So um, that's, that's all I can say on that, really. I haven't come across any documents that categorically state why. We can only speculate. Right, I've got another anonymous. Since we no longer believe magic is real, why do you think they believed it was real in the past? What do you think is the cultural reason behind people's belief in magic? These were really difficult times. And there are people who still believe magic is real. Um, you know, there are, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who do believe in the power of magic and they do believe that their magical practices work. And I'm not here to sit and say whether it does or it doesn't. But the cultural reasons, if you think these live, these people, especially in the north, in, in the West Fjords, they had brutal winters. They had no communication. They had to survive off the little that they had. And I think the power of belief, you've got to, you know, having a belief in something and thinking that drawing a sigil on a ram's horn to protect your flock psychologically gives you an advantage over just worrying about the flock all the time and I think it's the whole psychological is for a positive outlook on life and to have I think most people want to have something to believe in whether you believe in magic religion or something of your own I think people have that they want that power um, lots of thank yous thank you um, <laughs> I can see questions now, Louise. Okay. Um, I can see from the question, are trolls ever involved? Oh, I haven't done the one before that one. What's okay. that? That's Let's just the that Netflix. One. Haven't seen that. So we'll have a look. <laughs> okay. Trolls. Now, trolls is another interesting thing. That's a whole other talk altogether. What amazed me in Iceland is how much they believe in trolls and little people. And it's something like, I know this is off the top of my head, 60% of people believe in religion and God, and 90% of people believe in little people and trolls. And up in the West Fjords, there are very few houses that don't have a miniature house outside for the little people. And when you drive through valleys and you go, there's beautiful rounded boulders, and they believe that the little people live in those, and the trolls live in the landscape as well. So it's, They've not been involved in this. I haven't come across any trolls or little people within the witchcraft time, but post that, yes. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Pamela says she's enjoying the talk. Oh, she just wants to know are there other plans for more related? Um, oh, absolutely. Unsolicited plug now for next week. Yes. <laughs> I'm giving a talk next week on Voodoo. So if any of you want to sign up, please do. Yes. So that's a week tomorrow, Tuesday, the 30th of June, same time um, and on Zoom as well. So um, thank you for that. Um, somebody who joined later, so she apologises if you've covered it already. Are there any witch schools in Iceland um, and any that you would recommend? Oh, the more cultural side. Um, no, the museum is a really good venue. I haven't come across anybody that is sort of giving any talks or um, information on magical practices in Iceland. That's not to say there aren't any, because e even here it was very quiet for a long time and people are nervous. This is a subject that's still steeped in controversy and misunderstanding. So I've not come across any. However, that doesn't mean there aren't any. Iceland is still very sparse. And as I showed you by the pictures of Holmavik, you can see what a small, and that's one of the larger towns in that area. So um, there are the in Icelandic nationalists are a huge movement at the moment to um, revive the old ways. And the Witch Museum is, does a lot of educational talks. Um, and they finally allow you to take photographs as well, which has only happened in the last 12 months. So that's about the best I can offer at the moment. That's all I know. OK, thank you. And from Maria, who's from Russia, um, what is your book going to be about? The name and the theme. Do tell us more. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Maria. Um, well, at the moment, I'm finishing a book on witchcraft and spells and curses so hopefully that will be out later this year and that's called um a cabinet of curses and it will be published by troy books so do look out for that one that's what i'm finishing now and when that's finished i've got to finish another one about the museum of witchcraft in the uk then i want to concentrate on this for a while so i'm going to be exploring um atmospheric landscapes in Iceland so again using my artistic practice along with the written but I feel there's desperate need of a book on the history of Icelandic witchcraft in mm. English. Troy Books has already asked me if I would write one but um, I've got to plan my time well. Mm, fantastic, brilliant. Um, from Joanna Ferreira, are there magic symbols being found in specific places in, in houses for example in fireplaces or any witch bottles found. Um, thank you for such an amazing talk. I'm an archeologist and very interested in witchcraft and magic studies. Oh, thank you, Joanna. Um, there are not, the symbols weren't found in specific places at this time because the dwellings, if you can imagine, were really very rural. They had moss on the walls. They were made of wood stone. So there may have been scratch markings. We don't know the location. We know that the books were slotted on floorboards or under beds. There, I did find in the museum, um, again, I talked about the aristocracy believing that they weren't part of the witchcraft, that what they did was okay. And there's a beautiful, bed from a very wealthy house which has got witch markings carved into it which is quite interesting. Mm. Um, I haven't come across any witch bottles that we know of like we know in the UK and Europe where we insert things in and seal them to make a spell. There are things in the museum, um, I'm just trying to think, it was more using materials because I, I'm, I'm trying to think, if you think about the 17th century, materials were very sparse, so it was unlikely. So it was mainly carving. If they could find bits of paper, they would store those runes and draw them. But they were carved into bits of bone or bits of wood. I haven't come across anything similar to a witch bottle. There are spells that are similar to witchcraft in Europe and UK. Um, but not in the same way. I mean, we, we've got so many apotropaic marks in the UK that we're fortunate to find. A lot of the buildings in Iceland just don't exist, apart from some of these wealthy artefacts like the bed. Okay, thank you. Um, from an anonymous attendee, I'm curious about how you got interested in this subject. What is your academic background and why did you decide to get into this topic? Okay. Um, 
I'm not a practitioner, so I'm not a witch. I've, I've not um, practiced. I've always remained on the outside because I like to be objective. You, it's so easy to be criticized if you're too involved. My background is in illustration. I started my BA, my master's degree was focused on the culture of Haiti. And I soon discovered that voodoo in Haiti was nothing like live and let die, which I'd been led to believe it was all sacrifice and drums and walking dead. And it wasn't. It was colourful. It was integral. So I got interested in voodoo through my MA, began reading on it and became hooked. So did a PhD in the representations of voodoo. So I looked at how it had been shown in television, theatre, film, art, literature, all across cultural production. And from that, when I finished my PhD, I started researching the pins and dolls, which has nothing to do with voodoo, which is a bit of a spoiler for next week. Um, mm. It's very much about witchcraft. I then started going to the Museum of Witchcraft in Cornwall. Very long answer to a very short question. Um, but it was the poppets in Cornwall that got me fascinated with these pins and dolls and the cursing. And it just led to one thing after another. So um, I'm still very interested in the visual and the, the, the actual materials that these things are made from. Thank you. Um, and one of our colleagues at the university, Chelsea Slater, says that at uni they were shown that some of the European witch trials followed the same path as the early spread of Huguenots. Oh, the Huguenots, um, yeah. yeah. Were there any possible things that it could explain where in Iceland the accusations happened or was it mostly just where there were populations? No, it seems to be where there were less populations. More accusations seem to happen in the more rural areas. And I think that's because there was likely to be more conflict. And if you think whoever accused and if that if that particular priest, vicar, bishop succeeded, he got their possessions. Mm. I think it was more about corruption and power than it was about anything else if I'm brutally honest. And you also find that, I think in the Reverend Paul Bjornsson case, his brother-in-law was the sheriff. Um, and you often find that the, the actual jurors were friends or colleagues and, and it was really corrupt. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, Hannah says, firstly, thank you so much for your lecture. It sounds like witchcraft in Iceland was a way for people to explain unknown illnesses. I'm interested to know whether Iceland being so far removed from both Europe and America was at some points behind in the medical knowledge they had and whether this led to um, an increase in trials. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Hannah. The rural areas, if you, if you think back to the map with the red dots, the red dots around the coast of Iceland were quite few and far between. So places like Reykjavik and all of those areas would have powerful leaders who understood a bit more about medicine. All of those areas concentrated in the West Fjords, there would be little knowledge. So yes, it, again, it was power, it was control. The medical knowledge, that case of the women having horrendous swollen stomachs and belching sounds more like a dietary issue than it does about the devil coming into the church. You know, and in hindsight and reading now from the 21st century perspective, we can now try and understand those medical conditions. But at the time, they would have been quite frightening. Okay, thank you. I think you've possibly answered the next one. Is Iceland unique in believing that only men were capable of magic? Um, men have been accused um, accused of witchcraft before. Um, it's not it's not unique. You know, you think about the Salem witch trials. Giles mm. Corey was crushed to death. Um, he refused to say he was a witch. So out of the the executions in Salem, one of those was a man. It's not unique, but I think because men were, it was a very patriarchal society in a lot of these countries, the men ruled. So I guess originally in Iceland, men were deemed as capable because it was more powerful and they were deemed as more um, credible to be able to do sorcery until it flipped around and it was then something to be accused. But I haven't come across it anywhere else on the extent it is in Iceland. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The next one I think is more of a comment um, and it might mean more to you Louise than it does to me. From Gail you can download a... Oh, so you can get one of the books online yeah. so that's great. That's fine. Um, 
Thank you. And then the next one um, from Anonymous, is there a relationship between Icelandic witchcraft and Icelandic traditional medicine? Possibly. It's not something I've gone into yet. Obviously, as this develops, I will need to. This was a very, very much a starting point, just trying to find out the facts behind the trials and look at some of the documents. But um, as the practice across the world, you know, people who were accused of witchcraft were also accused, you know, they were the people who practiced traditional medicines. It wouldn't surprise me if there was a link. Okay, thank you. Um, Rachel is saying the talk is fascinating. She runs very long distances in remote places and she has a, t a tattoo of a runic compass like the ones you've shown in the Galdra box. Um, that she had to signify direction. She's now thinking that she needs to know the spell. <laughs> Most of them are for good. That's what I will, I will add that. There are very few spells that are for cursing as there are in the UK. Um, most of these practices are, and I should have said this at the start, with most witchcraft and sorcery, most of it is for good. It's for healing, it's for protection, it's for giving you strength, it's for helping your, your social whether it's money or um, you know, feeding yourself or just social mm -hmm. achievement. It's, it's more about that than it is. So Rachel, I wouldn't worry too much that you've cursed yourself. I think it's more, it would be interesting to know what it's for though. Okay, thank you. Um, Steph says, wonderful talk. She's also visited with friends, um, Holmovic, um, visited the two parts of the museum, including the Sorcerer's Cottage, 19 miles away. It was absolutely amazing. And I think, again, you've answered this. Do you think that some people were falsely, falsely accused to acquire land and possessions by people? Um, and then she also goes on to say there were the strange creatures at the museum that was said that women would grow a nipple to feed. But essentially, they were like creatures that would help with tasks but had to be killed when they got too large. I was wondering if we have any more information on these. There's a fantastic display in the museum at Hol Holmovic with a picture of a woman's leg that had a nipple on it. They were very fascinating creatures. <laughs> yeah, so you're talking about, um, okay, so first of all, I didn't mention the Sorcerer's Cottage, but yes, there's um, just, it's drivable from the museum, well worth a visit. It's, it's built with the turf roof out of wood, um, got schools and shells and stones outside and worth the trip. And it's in near a beautiful hot spring, which they've now built a big swimming pool to accommodate hot water. So in the middle of this amazing landscape, there's a bright blue pool, but um, <laughs> as there is all over Iceland, bizarrely. The creatures you're talking about, I've just made a note of them. They're called the Tilberi, T-I-L-B-E-R-I. -E and they were like, um, they're like giant maggots with a weird mouth on them. I don't know how else to describe them, but they knit them quite a lot. Um, and so I've, I've, got, I've got a little note here that says one source mentions an execution for keeping a tilbearer. So people were executed for having them alleged. They're like giant maggots. That's the only thing I can describe them as. Um, the woman has to steal her human rib from a churchyard in the early hours of Whitsunday, wrap it in grey wool and keep it between her breasts. The next time she takes Holy Communion, she must spit the sacramental wine over the bundle. The third spirit of Holy Wine will bring the Tiberi to life. When it grows larger and the mother can no longer conceal it in her bosom, she must cut loose a piece of skin on the inside of her thigh and make a nipple, which the tilbury will hang on to and draw nourishment from her bodily fluids. When the creature gets big enough and the mother orders him to steal milk from other farmers, he can then go very fast over fields and steal milk. And that's what it's all about. Mm. So oh. a very bizarre way to get some milk. Okay. But they are fascinating creatures, Steph, I agree. <laughs> Oh, okay, so I don't know. There are another ten questions according. Oh right, okay. To, so I don't know if you wanted to continue, Louise. Yeah, we can go for another five minutes or so. Okay, this is a very long comment now from an anonymous attendee. Um, interesting to hear about seventeenth-century ideas of witchcraft. However, regarding the gendering of magic pr practitioners in the pagan period, there may be a bit of oversimplification here. 
Um, many, many words used to represent both male and fe female magicians. Words relating to knowledge are used to refer to men as much as women. Um, the word seor is actually specifically associated with women and female sexuality. When it is applied to men, it is considered to be an emasculating insult, as it implies they have taken the female role in sex, um, also known as engaged in homosexual intercourse. In the pagan period in Iceland, magic was primarily attached to women. Um, Following the Christianization in 999, it seems men were increasingly connected with magical practice. And there are various articles. Yeah. The article, yeah. And I totally agree, it was a simplification. Um, the word side, not cider without the R, um, and SEI does feature as the word relating to magic. Um, it does feature in a particular document from 834 to 1000 relating to side men, which is magic men. But I totally agree, um, it is a simplification for the purposes of this talk because trying mm -hmm. to show that gender differential. Mm -hmm. And men were increasingly connected with magical practice. And I think that Jenny, Jenny Jockin's um, article that's been referred to at the bottom mm -hmm. does talk about how men increasingly became connected. But no, it's as I said, it, with Salem there were men accused with across Europe men have been accused but it's mm. it was to make that simplification because there's no denying the fact that 20 men were executed only one woman in mm. Iceland yeah okay thank you. thank you Doreen is writing a book um, about um, a ghost that's been in her family for nine generations do you have anything to say about ghosts Carl Bjornsson's granddaughter is said to have first received this ghost Oh, that's interesting, because yeah, Bjornsson yeah. is obviously the family that had yeah. so many executed. Um, ghost is a whole, other, a, a whole other topic that I'm fascinated with. Um, I think, I don't, I don't know a lot about, I mean, it's fascinating. I do, I do know a lot of accounts where ghosts have been generational. And that's, mm. I find that fascinating that they're passed down the generations. Mm, yes. Ghosts is a whole area, another paranormal area that I'm fascinated in, but not linked to this. Um, but thank you for the comment. And I think the fact that it's from his granddaughter mm. is really interesting. And I yeah, think that incredible. conversation at some point. Yes, definitely. Um, someone just asking, saying that they'll miss the voodoo talk, but will it be repeated or can it be recorded? Be recorded. So it will be recorded and it will be available. Um, so we can make that available. It'll be on the University Centre Telford YouTube channel as well as um, in other places as well, won't it Louise? Yes, um, definitely. Okay, Fumbelina is asking, is saying this is a good resource, Icelandic folk and fairy tales by okay. Mayand Halberg Balmundsen, uh, which mentions the schools of witchcraft in quite a recent context. Um, and this is where she read about the bishops being accused and the dark schools. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I was focusing predominantly on the 17th century. Uh, I had limited time to go and look at that stuff. So, um, but thank you for that. Um, as, as, let's have a look. A student just saying that she signed up for the talk next week, desperate to get back to um, uh, learning at university rather than um, learning virtually. Because We're all of, desperate um, to get back, I yeah. promise you. <laughs> um, and another anonymous um, asking whether there are any contemporary records of the symbols existing um, out with Iceland, especially of the aristocracy that practiced witchcraft traveled. Okay, um, I think the symbols, they're especially the helm of awe because people became interested in the myths Norse mythology and Odin and I think all of those Norse gods and Norse myths became global once the the word spread and the sagas were written down and there's a great book it's a lovely little thick book on the saga so if you're interested I can't, I can't remember the author um, just look for Icelandic sagas but it probably did travel out because mm -hmm. the Helm of Awe is widely known, even if people don't know what the symbol is for. And the lady who talked about having the compass tattooed on her, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's another example. These, these symbols are out there. 
whether it's to do with the aristocracy, I'm not sure, or just the fact that the, it was the Danish and then it moved to Denmark and then it would have translated across Europe. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody just asking, have you looked at the instances of women practicing magic in saga literature? Is that Paul Grima is a good one for a start? Then there's the volure too, there's quite a crowd. Yes, yeah, there are. Um, and again, going back to that comment that somebody made about me simplifying this down to gender, male, female, magic, non-magic. Um, yes, there is a lot in the sagas about women practicing, but this, this was focused totally on the executions of the men and one woman and looking at the historical context of that. But this is much broader. There's so much more to say about this and so much mm. more for me to learn. You know, it's quite early in the journey, really. Okay, thank you. Just a comment from Mark Davis. Very interesting and informative, brilliant presentation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mark. And then the last question, is there Icelandic witchcraft prescribed using water and spells so the person receives it and by drinking? I assume that's... Um, I don't know. If you, if you want to look at spells, I suggest you look at Flowers and Smith's books on Icelandic because they really dig into the spells and the, the sigils. Okay, and that's it. I think you have 25 questions in all, Louise, which is a record. So that's well right. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was fascinating. And thank, thank you very you much. Thank you everybody for, and thank you Paula for hosting. And Sorry, I lost you briefly there. Not sure what happened. <laughs> thank you, Louise. Thank you. Lots of thank yous coming in from the audience as well. Lovely. Brilliant. So we look forward. So hopefully I'll see some of you next week. Well, I won't actually see you, but I'll, I'll see your number on the screen. Um, yeah, uh, brilliant. Thanks very much, Louise. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.